social assumptions. Hey, you got any doubts or something about EPOP? Any doubts or something about bracketing? I wouldn't know what to talk about that. But, okay, there's something about phenomenology, but it doesn't talk about the socio-cultural context. So she says that why not blend the two together? Why not blend phenomenology with socio-cultural context? And she then stresses the importance of a new phenomenology. She mentions this in one of the primary texts, in one of the texts that I've engaged with, which is called the uses of literature, which was written in 2008, by the way, before the term post became so popular. Now in 2008, she came up with this idea of a new, phenomena, a new phenomenology of reading. But later she doesn't pursue this project in full earnest. She, for some reason, she gives it up. And so I said, why not pursue that? At least we won't come up with a new phenomenology of reading, but we can uh, chart the way ahead for literary studies. So uh, it has enormous potential. So, so OK, and also, people might ask me, OK, so why not do something radically? Why reorient something that has existed? Why reorient the section study? Do something new, maybe after network theory. But I would say here, I would, I, I follow John literally, uh, I seem to agree with him. You know? He says that sometimes rediscovery or recalibration of an existing field could be as innovative as a radical reorientation. So, uh, okay, there are reasons why I don't, uh, again, there are, uh, I could speak endlessly about this, so I cannot waste your time here and move to the research questions. Uh, uh, all right, so these are the four research questions that I focus on. I've divided reception study in four different aspects. One is the phenomenologically driven aspect of reception, reader response or reception. And so my first question would be, how can phenomenology-driven reader response theories contribute to the folk philosophy and post-critical project of finding a new phenomenology of reading? The second would be about there are certain reception theories, like I've mentioned the theories here, Stanley Fish, Tony Bennett, Stanley Fish, for instance. He talks about something called interpretive communities. But why do we interpret the text the way we do? Because we belong to certain communities which teach us to interpret the text. So there are, obviously, a person could have several community affiliations. But at the end of it, these theories can be grouped together under this uh, broad umbrella term called social politically oriented reception. So uh, Stanley Fish comes up with the idea of interpretive communities. Tony Bennett talks about something called reading formations. Then there is Stephen Mylau who talks about uh, rhetorical hermeneutics, and then John Trout talks about regimes of reading. Now again, this is these things are, are too technical, so I didn't talk about them right now. But then moving forward to something called reception history. Now this is another aspect of reception. How, why why is it that certain texts uh, never gain popularity during the period in which they were written? There was there's a text called uh, there's, there was a poem called Goblin Market, which was written in, in the late 19, in the late nineteenth century by Christina Rossi. But it never gained that much attraction. It was revived by feminist scholars later who identified its incipient feminist possibilities, its incipient feminist potential. And so uh, why not study about these things? Why not work on these things? Reception, history. Why do certain texts resonate with an audience around 100 years ago? That's an important question to explore. So this is reception study, uh, reception history. And there are two main figures again, Hans Georg Gadamer who talks about it, and then uh, uh, the main figure, the pioneering figure in period of reception history, and John uh, So, okay, and then the, first, the fourth one is more of a speculative kind of research question, where I focus on certain peripherally located reader response or reception theories, and how we can bring them to the core after this post critical recovery. Okay, so, okay, and then about the methodology. So, I, I use obviously certain methods of analysis, and it's not textual analysis because I don't view language as a neutral medium of expression. Language is always has certain social, political, cultural moorings. So language use is always invested. And so I would say that discourse analysis does involve an element of textual analysis. But again, there are two elements of discourse analysis there. The first is critical discourse analysis. Now, if someone has read Baker Griffin's essay on discourse analysis, they'll know that there's no hard and fast rule for discourse analysis. So you can blend, you can mix and match according to your study. So I have decided uh, this is a curious combination between critical discourse analysis and opinion discourse analysis. Why do I do this? Because critical discourse analysis is always talking about context, about how language produces the social culture in the world, and is in turn constituted by the social culture. But that might, you know, uh, be antithetical to, uh, might be in direct opposition to post-critical. 
So I have decided to temper it slightly. I've also added a dose of bhakti in the sports analysis to it. So that bhakti is a figure who has never been questioned by either Felsky or Moin or anyone else. Because he talks about well, what does bhakti do? I think this is easy to explain. Bhakti talks of any kind of languages, any kind of utterance, as not inherently pure, but it has a numerous it is the site of contestation between several ideas. So you, whenever you say something, you believe you're speaking, let's say, the king's language, but it's never the king's language. You are always, it's always mixed with several things that you would be even ashamed of. Maybe uh, by the time you end up using something that is slang in several ways. Something that might be, uh, you know, so he talks about an impossibility of discursive theory. So he says that any of any of you, whether we speak, it's about language use, it's about literature, it's permeated with others' voices. So any kind of discourse, here I'm arguing that post critique and reception study are not internally homogeneous conceptual blocks. They have a lot of internal variation in between them. And they engage into uh, engage in relationships of contestation at times and symbiosis at times. So they sometimes mutually reinforce each other and sometimes contest each other. So I, I pay attention to these points of intersection between reception study and post critique from a Bakhtinian point. Uh, so that's it. So uh, initially, I think sir circulated uh, a notice where he, uh, where the title of the thesis was a dialectical reevaluation, and I changed it slightly. I went through it again, and I felt, you know, I, I'm a very fastidious writer, so I always, I'm very fussy about the words I use. And so I said, okay, let me replace it with dialogic rather than dialectic. Why did I do this? Because dialogic has some Hegelian overtones. Dialogic talks about something to conceptual blocks that are always opposed to each other, but dialogue is not always that. So uh, Hegel talks about thesis, active thesis, and how they're synthesized. But I am more concerned about how these two theoretical paradigms engage in dialogue with each other, which is not always antithetical, not always opposition. Uh, so this is it. So uh, dialogic inter interaction